Hello. Today I'm joined by Brian Kirschman, Portfolio Manager at GQG Partners. Welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Right. So uh, GQG stands for Global Quality Growth. Can you just explain a bit what that means to you and also how valuation of stocks fit within that framework? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of you know quality, we believe that there is a dynamic view of quality over time. There are different areas where quality will exhibit itself and sort of fade over time. And the example uh, you know I love to use here is energy. So people, you know, 10 years ago might have said, you know, after the shale collapse that Exxon is not a high quality asset. Uh, it's commoditized, there's no differentiation in the product um, and, and things like that. Um, but if you go 20, 30, 40 years ago, you ask a room full of people, is Exxon a high quality product? They would say, absolutely yes. You know, it's a very you know, blue chip company and all my sort of pension funds and things like that. The largest market cap company in the world. So what we need to determine as investors is why that was quality then, why it was perceived to be have a lack of quality over the last couple of years, and why we think it actually could uh, exhibit quality on a go-forward basis again uh, going, uh, going ahead. Um, in terms of the valuation piece and the valuation aspect of it, uh, we want to make sure we're paying a reasonable price. Uh, so even when we look at things that are quote unquote value types of names, I'm not necessarily paying um, for that valuation expansion. I just need to be able to get that return from an EPS and dividend yield perspective, assuming that multiple stays flat, the multiple increases from there, you know, that's a, that's a call option. On the growth end of the spectrum, I may bake in some conservatism to make sure that I'm not paying too much for that growth opportunity, so the headroom of that opportunity set comes down. I'm um, not baking in too much, um, but we're also you know, very valuation sensitive on that aspect too. Okay, so it looks like you're very much bottom up driven, yes. but can you give us an idea of today with a macro framework and things have changed a lot even over the last decade, what comes in from the top down, if at all? Yeah, absolutely, so we are a bottom up shop. Um, the way I like to describe it is we're macro aware. Um, and by macro aware, I mean, you know, even a, a company like a Nestle, for example, if you're getting the macro wrong and they're not able to price through inflation or cost or, or pass through the cost, that's still going to be a problem for them. They're going to run into headwinds. And even if it's a stable asset, that's a problem. So you have to be aware. But, but really, the bigger way that we use macro is in terms of this concept of a switch on versus a switch off. We won't buy a name based on a switch on. We won't say, hey, Brazil looks fantastic. We need to go find a bunch of names that fit the bill. It'll grow organically based on the fundamental bottom-off work. But in converse, we could apply a switch off in that situation. If there's a geopolitical or macro situation, we'll allow that to override the fundamental bottom-up thesis and we'll exit out of sort of an entire group of names on that premise. So it's more of a risk management tool. You mentioned the Nestle example, a bit of inflation, but can you just give, a, give us an idea of just how you see companies as a whole, really? Because, you know, cost of debt is in increasing, um, squeeze consumers, can they pass on margins? What, what's going on there from, from your, your side of things? Yeah, so I, I think this is the interesting aspect of the market right now. I think this is where it's becoming very idiosyncratic in terms of what companies can actually pass through those costs, what companies can absorb those costs. Uh, you think about there's a whole slew of very cheap debt that was taken on over the course of COVID uh, for a lot of different reasons. A lot of that debt's going to be coming due in the next couple of years that you'll have to refinance. So how does the consumer sort of absorb that behavior? How do companies absorb it? And how do you find the ones that can you can best uh, sort of navigate your way through that type of environment? Up to this point, the consumer has held up remarkably well, both in sort of the European context and the U.S. context. Um, job market remains robust. So I think if you find the right companies that can take advantage of sort of these opportunities, and uh, you know, things that people need, basically, and, and are able to pass through those prices in various different areas, um, then I think you can do pretty well. Okay, and very, very briefly now, you've bought back into some of those uh, loved FANG stocks from the, yes. um, you know, the were popular, let's say, a decade ago, um, or over a decade for the decade, really drove markets up. Um, you bought uh, Apple in Q3 last year, uh, Meta recently, Alphabet recently. Um, you see them clearly has got a good growth trajectory from here. So very briefly, just on, on some of those, what's the yeah. uh, view there? So one of the big issues that we had with a lot of these companies is that, especially like a Meta and an Alphabet, is that people weren't necessarily reflecting or uh, realizing and appreciating the cyclicality in those businesses. They're ad-driven revenue models, and they're sort of being lumped into this bucket of these high-quality, long-term compounders, and people weren't pricing in the, the potential slowdown that could happen, and they were assigning higher multiples as there was a count, uh, sort of a compounder. What we were believing is that it is going to, as digital advertising sort of filled out and stopped taking as much share from linear advertising, because there's not as much to share from that, um, that they would start acting more cyclical, like the underlying you know, markets. So think of like an ad-driven revenue model, something like a WPP, a publicist, uh, you know, those types of names, Omnicom. They trade at high single-digit, low-double-digit types of multiples. Well, now, 
Meta and Alphabet have traded more in that range, that mid to high teens sort of multiple. So it is reflected as a cyclical, still a high quality business. There are some green shoots in terms of uh, you know advertising reaccelerating and, and impressions coming back, and they're managing their costs better. So it's allowing them to drive a little bit more of that cash flow. Um, Apple is honestly just a, a stable, you know, staple uh, of a compounder, and we think that people are just mispricing the services opportunity on the back end of that. Um, you look at the, the growth and even the resale market of, of Apple phones globally, that's all contributing to a user base, so to speak, and they continue to monetize that much higher margin business over time. So we, we like that sort of a, as a compelling opportunity as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank Excellent. you very much, Brian. Thank you so much. For more news, views, and analysis on fund managers, feel free to visit morningstar.co.uk or any of our other international websites.